Yeah, Shabbat Shalom everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This week we're in Torah portion, Nitzavim, as we can see on the screen. And we're reading from Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 10, to chapter 30, verse 20. So it's only very short this week. We've only got a, a chapter and a half. You know, Tommy asked me to stand in and I, this week, and I was a bit like, oh, should I, should I not? I'm a bit busy. And then I looked and thought, it's only a chapter and a half. So you know what, I, uh, I can yeah. do this. I can get away with this. <laughs> and then when I, I realised myself, I thought, mm. Maybe I should have done it. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the next one will be like five and a half chapters long. There it goes. Yeah, yeah. Just select from there with a longer That's true. You could you could do a whole portion on one one line. Yeah. But our Lord dictates all things, so it's all good. Yeah, and and we can never limit the word of God. I, I know we do this every year, but truly we we, we could. You could do the whole year just on this taller portion, like like you really could. Uh, the word of God is infinite; it's it's limitless. Um, so it's it's beautiful, and it's a beautiful portion this week. It, it, to be fair, you could you, Tommy could have just done this week on his own because if you just read it, it it's quite self-explanatory. Yeah. It's 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 very forward, and it it, said, it does what it says on the tin, and it, it's a beautiful piece of text, and it's a plea from Moses and we're seeing now where we're up to in the narrative of the Torah. We're, we're right before the promised land and Moses knows he's not getting in so he's not holding any punches. He's sharing, look, I'm not gonna be able to get in but I want you to have the best time when you're in that land. I want you to be blessed. So it's a plea really to Israel. Uh, it's a prophetic plea and it's, it's so beautiful and we're gonna see today how it actually applies to us. And the Torah portion itself, it, it is a very simple message for those who have read it this week. It, 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 it is a quite basic message, but when you think about it really, that the Bible is, is a very simple message um, at, at face value. It, it's us that make it complex. And it's, it is simple, but it's hard to master. <laughs> and that, that's the reality of the Word of God. At a face value, it's very simple, but hard to, to master. It should be child like a child should be able to understand the word. <clears throat> so this week we're going to read how the word of God is actually going to speak to us. Um, and, and I think there's something quite interesting this week. Because this text explicitly breaks the fourth wall and addresses us, the readers, this week. And it's a uni unique occurrence. Um, and, and we could say, oh, well... The, the words are always addressing the reader, but I think it goes to another extent this week. And on a literal level, I do believe it's breaking the fourth wall. And we're going to get into that this week of how it's, how the text is, is speaking and pointing to us today in Birkenhead 2022, <laughs> sitting here in jeans and, uh, you know, <laughs> um, it, it is, it's addressing us. Um, so I hope that's piqued your interest because I've, I've got a few interesting things I'd like to share with you. But before we get into it, um, if I could hand it over to Tom and just, if you could break down what Nitzavim means, please, from the, from the Hebrew, brother. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, thanks, Jacko. Bless you, bro. Yeah, Nitzavim, yeah. Um, it, the, the most common translation is standing, isn't it? Or standing ones. Yeah. Um, one standing, standing ones, standing, yeah, all those similar uh, definitions. This word Nitzavim comes from the, the verb uh, Natsav, which itself means... Um, to be upright or to even to, to take one stand, uh, something that's established. And uh, even like to stand firm or to station oneself and to take an upright position. So it's more than just like loitering on a street corner. Yeah. It's standing with some kind of purpose, you know. Um even carries a, a, a like a military kind of uh, connotation, you know. You can picture the sold a soldier or even an army that's ready, armed for battle, uh, standing ready and armed, you know. And um, here, as you mentioned, it's Moses uh, carrying on with his final discourse, isn't it? And the, the, the people now have been equipped with the Torah, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is our armour. The Torah and the Word of God is our armour, you know. Um, so the people have received the instructions of God and now they're, they're, they are now standing with a readiness, um, almost as like they're being recruited by their commander, you know. Um, it reminds us of, once again, the armour of God, which we, we read in Ephesians. This is, this is our armour, 
you know, and we are like soldiers for God. It's not a, a physical warfare, it's spiritual warfare, you know. I think the text itself says stand firm in the armour of God or something along those yes, lines. Yeah. Yeah, so this this standing here that we read of in the past, you know, it's 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 a standing that's comes with equipment an equipped kind of standing, you know. As I said, not just standing around doing it, but, but an equipped standing. Um, it represents those who are correctly dressed and equipped uh, to be functional, to, uh, to be obedient, uh, faithful, trustworthy. Soldiers that have been enlisted by their, their commander. Um, I often think when we come to this parsha that if this world that we live in with a game of um, last man standing, who do you think will be the last man standing? It's going to be our, our, our leader, our commander, our God, Yeshua. He's the last man standing, you know. But if and when we abide in him, we can all stand. Mm. We can all stand only through him. You wow, know? beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's Nitzavim. Yeah, thanks, brother. It's, it's, um, it's the theme of the past. It's very, very simple. It's a recruitment going on, isn't it, between God and his people. So, Nitzavim in a nutshell. The Parsha of Nitzavim includes some of the most fundamental principles of our faith. It opens with an invitation to all people, given the opportunity to be able to enter into covenant with the creator of the universe. It then goes on to warn God's people of their future exile and the desolation of the promised land as consequence for not following his ways. Although there is hope, a prophecy is given that in the end he will gather his people and circumcise, soften their hearts to want to walk in his statutes and his commandments. The Parsha continues by speaking of the practicality of the Torah, that God's commandments are not too hard for us to follow. It then ends with the freedom of choice, an opportunity to choose life or death, blessing or curse, God or the absence of him in our lives. So praise Yah, it's, 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 it's a real, it's a real, um, it's a real gospel message this week. I, I, I really believe it. It's, it's, we're going to unpack it. We're going to get into it. We're going to break it down. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Tommy. And we're just going to read from verse 10 uh, to the end of the chapter, please, brother. All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you, and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I make this covenant and this oath not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt, and that we came through the nations which you passed by, and you saw their abominations and their idols which were among them, wood and stone and silver and gold, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God, to go and save the gods of these nations, and that they may not be among you a root-bearing bitterness or wormwood. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this case that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, even though I follow the dictates of my heart, as though the junkard could be included with the sober. The Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every case that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity, according to all the cases of the covenant that are written in the, this book of the law, so that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord has laid on it. The whole land is brimstone, salt and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. All nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? 
then people would say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, for they went and saved other gods and worshipped them, gods that they did not know and that they had not given to them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on its every case that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, in wrath and in, in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we, that we may do all the words of this law. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. I mean, it's just beautiful text. You don't even need me this week. You can just keep reading. We're going to look at the blessings and curses. Um, a little bit of apologetic, really, with the blessings and curses, because here we read um, the curses attached to the covenant, and in the next chapter we're going to read the blessings, so hang fire with me. Um, but throughout the Torah we do see this this theme, this duality that's taken place, the blessings and curses, and I like to um, imagine it as uh, more so as blessings and consequences. That's how I like to picture it, because we know, we read from like the Psalms, even when the angel of death passed over uh, and, and took out the firstborn, uh, firstborns in Egypt. We read that it was like a band of destroying angels in the Psalms. So we know that God isn't, isn't a murderer. How I like to see it is that, is that he's actually protecting this reality from falling apart. Mm -hmm. And what he's actually doing is he's saying, well, if you don't want me, I'm just going to remove my protection and see how you get on on your own. And it's a consequence of our own actions. So... When we're seeing these blessings and curses, think of them as blessings and consequences. It's, it's if you're going to do this, you naturally, by cause and effect, are going to bring about this upon you. And you've all heard the saying in the world, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, he had it coming to him, maybe even heard the karma. Um, what you reap, what you sow, uh, biblical um, term. And it, it, it's evident, isn't it? In this reality, there is a level of cause and effect. There just is. And the Bible, the biblical definition of this is blessings and curses. And we, we have to think, well, if God, you know, some people will ask them, well, if God is real, why hasn't he destroyed all evil? You know, it, why can't he just bless us? Why can't he just bless, bless, bless us? Well, if God was going to start with destroying all evil, he would start with me and you. <laughs> let's, let's get facts straight, you know, you would start with me and you. And in the word we read that, that, there's, 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 the judgment is being delayed here, so more souls can be, um, can turn to faith, can repent, and, and it's actually a level of mercy. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God and are all wicked in comparison to the creator of love, the source of life. Here's a few scriptures to back this up. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Wow, beautiful. Let's have a look in Ezekiel. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So when we put it in that perspective, it really is, it's blessings and consequences. It's like, look, my son, if you're going to go out there and, and, and bring death into this world, the natural cause and effect is you're going to receive death. You know, e even those who don't have a faith can see that in this world. And this is what we, it, it's confirmed within scripture. So m moving on now, this Parsha beautifully opens up with in verse 10 it says all of you stand before the lord your god okay our parsha beautifully opens up and addresses all those who want to know god and entered into covenant with him and it goes out the way here the text to say it doesn't matter if you're an elder if you're a child if, you, if you're a stranger it even goes to say you know the one who cuts your wood or the one who draws your water all here have an opportunity to come into covenant with the with with our father with Yahweh, they all have a, a an open invitation and it's 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 quite a potent bit of scripture here because i believe in this partial this is where we actually see a, a, a level of um a covenant being applied here and it's it, it, it's saying this day throughout this partial we're going to say this day um you know choose you know this is the theme throughout this partial this day choose who, whom you may serve 
and right down to the child is, is counted to make his own decision um, to, to, to enter into covenant with the Lord. And we see here, I make this covenant and this oath as well as with him who is not here with us today. So we read, wait, hang on. So we read the partial opens up. I make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands with us today before the Lord our God. Okay, I can understand that. It's the time that it was written. But then it goes on to say, as well as with him who is not here with us today. That's fascinating, isn't it? When you actually think about it. So this, this covenant, this what's taken place here, it's not just for those who was receiving it there and then. To me, that is like mind blowing. That is breaking the fourth wall. If I was, if I'm reading the text, if I'm reading for the Bi the Bible for the first time, and I see these people being able to come into covenant with, with with the Creator of the universe, and then I read, as well as with Him who is not here with us today, that's us. <laughs> we wasn't there two thousand years ago. Put your hand up. You was there two thousand years ago. It, it, that, that that that's us. And it's a it's a beautiful bit of text that what we're seeing here. That that that. It, it's applying to us. He's, it, it, the, the word of God is eternal. And, it, and if, if his character is who is, who was, and who is still to come, when we see the word of God uh, addressing God's people, of course it, it can apply to us. We know this is Moses speaking, but the sages say at this point um, in, in Moses' life, every word that Moses was speaking, it was like it was from the, from the mouth of God. You know, the, 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 the final speech what he's having here was, was prophetic, it was powerful. So we need to take rest in this now. So before we go any further in the partial, we really need to grasp this, understand this, digest it, take it in. Because if this is applying to those who is not here with us today, we, we really need to consider what's, what's, uh, what's going to be said now. And I just love as well in these couple of verses how Joe last week spoke about the true vine, didn't he? Um, Yeshua HaMashiach, he's the true vine and we are the branches but what do we see? Uh, a couple of verses here at the bottom. We see um, a contrast. You know, speaking of blessings and curses, we see we see the root bearing bitterness. So we've got the true vine, which is Yeshua, but we also see this other root, which is the root bearing bitterness um, or wormwood. So anyone reading this to me, it's addressing them. This is breaking the fourth wall quite literally, giving the opportunity to the reader to take part in this covenant, to be in the book of life. Every scripture is God-breathed and profitable for instruction, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is what I see taking place here. This is a timeless book and a timeless message. So reading on now in this, in, in, in this text, what, what, what we see here, how, how else can this apply to us, okay? So if we read on, I will make this covenant this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt, that we came through the nations which you passed by, and you saw their abominations and the idols which were among them, wood and stone and silver and gold, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. I mean, that's us again. You know, we, we, we dwelt in the land of Egypt. Egypt throughout the Bible is synonymous with the world. It, it is, it just is. You know, us being in this world, we've all been called to this room today. Why? Because we've noticed there's something quite off. We've had a calling on our life. We've seen, as the text says here, we've saw their abominations and their idols among them. We've seen the, the terror and the, and the violence and the, and the disruption that's going on within the world. And we thought, wow, okay, I don't want to be in Egypt anymore. I, I, I want to cross over. I want to become a Hebrew. So this is, this, is, this is what we're seeing in the text here. This is prophetic for us. And you could ask, well, do we have idols of silver and gold? You know, let's be honest, we're seeing idols here. We're seeing idols of stone, of wood, of silver and gold. How can this apply to me? You know, I, I personally don't own any gold. You know, I, I just, I have a, you know, bit of fake gold maybe a bit of bling bling <laughs> I don't know own any any 24 carats how, how can this apply to me we've read about the golden calf in scripture we see how gold in that way can be synonymous with with worship 
you know, we see, we see how when the golden calf came out, what, what, what did the people of Israel say? You know, this is our God. You know, they started worshipping it, dancing around it. So how can, this tr how can this apply to us? Did you know your mobile phone contains precious metals, including silver and gold? Who would have thought 50 years ago we would all be carrying around a little object containing silver and gold and it would actually become the building block of our society? Here's something I pulled from um, BBC Future. Your old phone is full of untapped precious metals. Every smartphone contains precious metals, including silver and gold. And then I've got a video here of how we can actually recover gold from chips. Um, in, com in computer chips, there's, there's, element, there's elements of gold that's taking place here. So for those who are thinking, hang on, I haven't got no gold. Well, what about this? Let's consider this then, Israel. Let's consider how this can apply to us today. Because who would have thought, like 50 years ago, if that, that mobile phones would be the focal point of so many people's lives. It would be the source of people's entertainment and the source of knowledge. That doesn't sound like the golden calf at all, does it? You know, when 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 he was all dancing around the golden calf, when he was saying that this is this is this is an object that the Lord's made. It just come out. It just come out of the fire. You know, for me, that's that's speaking of, of a higher knowledge of, a, of of something quite supernatural. And in society, we even say, we, you know, just ask Google. What 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 does Google say? Let's punch it in. The source of knowledge. If Google if Google um, if Google says it's all right, it's all right with me. You know, I'm sure everyone in this room has probably had like a bit of a cold or a bit of a something going on with them and he punched in, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with them, the symptoms on Google and you don't want to do it. <laughs> it'll, um, it'll write you off with a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So consider this, consider this, saints, really. You know, something that we carry around every day with precious metals and it can't be made. It actually can't be made without these precious metals, you know. The chips inside, the, uh, um, gold is actually a, is, is a high conductor of electricity and for whatever reason, it, it, it's needed inside these chips. What do we read in scripture? James 1.5. Don't ask Google, ask James. <laughs> now, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. The one giving generously to all and not finding fault and it will be given to him. So we see here that the formula is, if we, are, if we are truly wanting to search something, let him ask from God. That's what we see in the formula in scripture. So where else do we see silver and gold in our society? So we've got mobile phones. I mean, they've slipped quite undetected really, haven't they? I mean, think of how much they're, they're used in our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're using a mobile phone now for the Zoom. And I know that one day these have got to go. And I know that one day they're going to be used to a point where where, where we won't want to use them anymore. All, us as God's people will be like, look, they've, 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 they've saved us for the time as a tool so far, but, but it's just too much now. So I, I, I know that we're coming up to that time. We can see it, can't we? We're seeing vaccine passports on the phone, apps, this and the other. So at what point does it become the golden calf? But where else do we see silver and gold in our society? If it's not our phone, where else do we see it? <clears throat> I believe we see it at Christmas time. You know, we see the gold star on top of the tree. We see the silver tinsel. You know, take note again that we see, you saw the abominations and their idols which were among them, wooden stone and silver in gold. What's prophesied in Jeremiah? We read, do not learn the ways of the nations. Okay, we just seen in Deuteronomy, we came through the nations. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by the signs in the heavens, though the nations themselves are terrified by them. For the customs of the peoples are worthless. They cut down a tree from the forest. It is shaped with a chisel by the hands of a craftsman. They adorn it with silver and gold and fasten it with hammer and nails so that it will not totter. So we see here another form of silver and gold in our, in our society. And, and the word tinsel is actually, uh, it's, it's a colour as well. And tin, tinsel is actually like a, um, it's like a soft, it's like a cool grey. And, and then we have the gold um, with, with, with the star. You know, for, for me, you couldn't get any, any more satanic, to be honest with you. You know, you've got a dead tree coming into your home with a five star, <laughs> a golden star at the top of it wrapped in silver tinsel. You know, to me, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, 
esoteric, esoteric knowledge that we're seeing here, uh, forbidden knowledge. So much so that um, in 1647, we actually see Christmas was banned in England. Okay, we, we, we know this through our history. And it was, it was classified as a satanical practices. And also, it was also banned in certain states in the, in, 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 in the 1600s again. In 1659 in Boston, we see that it was, it was outlawed. So we see this, this taking place here of, of idolatry coming in and then this infiltration. And unfortunately, um, the, the state where we're up to now in, in, in the world events, it, it's here, isn't it? You know, it's not banned, it's not outlawed, it's in its full force. So it makes us think, you know, what the silver and gold, silver and gold, it's there, it's all there for me. It's there with our mobile phones, it's there with our um, festives of the world. And if you're feeling maybe a bit of resistance in your heart to what I've shared here, you know, I just ask that, that, that we read the word, we continue further. And what, what we go on to read in the word, it says, and so it may not happen. When he hears the words of this curse, okay, so if you, if you fall into this idol worship, it says, when he hears the words of this curse, that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, even though I follow the dictates of my heart, as though the drunkard could be included with the sober, the Lord would not spare him, for the anger and the Lord, sorry, the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against this man. And every curse that is written in the book would settle on him and the Lord will blot out his name from under the heavens. I mean, that's a serious scripture right there. And we all need to check ourselves daily on this one because we need to pray that we never bless, bless ourselves in our heart and think things are permissible. I mean, I've heard a lot of people say, look, you know, Christmas, it's for the kids. Christmas, it's, it's for the children. But really what you're actually doing is you're blessing yourself in your heart. If you've came into the knowledge and understanding of this, we do read here that this is applying for those who have took this oath, is applying for those who do have this level of understanding, I've been told, this level of understanding. I do, I do believe that. I believe um, our, our, our creator will weigh people differently and thank God he's, he's the judge and not me. But we're seeing here, we're seeing here that it, you know, a, a dangerous, a dangerous verse, you know, one who blesses himself in his heart, let us not fall into that, please. Um, we've read it, you know, a couple of parshas ago, how Korah, you know, I, I believe, I 100% believe Korah thought he had a right to, to serve in the, in, the, in the tabernacle in the way the Le Levi um, priested. He, in fact, he was a Levi, but he wanted to serve a certain way. I believe 100% that he blessed himself in his heart. I believe that Pharaoh blessed himself in his heart. We even read in the text that, that, that his heart was hardened, don't we? So we need to review ourselves daily that we don't do this, that we don't come, succumb to this. We read in Jeremiah a couple of weeks ago, I read the scripture that the heart is deceitful above all things. So we do have to test these things, please. If you're watching online, you're thinking, you know, Christmas, it's not that bad. You know, mobile phones, you know, I, I, you know, may, may, maybe that's a bit far-fetched. Search these things out for yourself. Um, be a Berean. Study them for yourself because the last thing we want to do is, is bless. Um, bless our own hearts and think we're doing the will of God. And there's a famous quote, and I think this was from C.S. Lewis. I couldn't find it online, but I, I thought it was quite, quite beautiful. Those who think they are doing good can do far more damage than utterly evil because they have the approval of their own conscience. And I mean, it's serious, isn't it? It's so serious. And that goes to people in Christianity, that goes for us, that goes for people, um, it even goes for people out there in the world, what we've seen with COVID. I mean, they believe consciously that they're doing good, when in fact, we, we, we are seeing restrictions taking place that's actually um, abusing. Um, and power and freedom. We really need to evaluate this Israel in all aspects of our walk. We, we really need to become studious of the word, study it for ourselves, don't listen to what I say. Go home, study the word, make up your own conclusion. Everyone should work out their own salvation through fear and trembling. And what's our landmark? Well, we know what our landmark is. We know what our guide is. This is why we need the Torah. 
because love can be defined in so many different ways but how do we come back to ground zero it's the it's the it's the torah isn't it that's how we come back to the level how do we interpret god's love how how is it that he wants to be loved you know we've got to remember it's not how we want to love him it's how he wants to be loved we're the ones who are worshiping him not him worshiping us so we need to we need to bear that in mind when we're when we're going through the word you know how, how does god want to be saved here how does god want to be worshiped and ultimately the the, the for me the the, the the apex of this of how to discern if something is from god or if something is from the enemy is is its fruits you'll know them by the fruits and i think this has got to be in a, in a spiritual sense it's got to be through um you know the fruits of the spirit or the fruit of the spirit um, and, and i think that's how we can truly discern um, if something is from god and also by deuteronomy um, deuteronomy itself we read how to detect a false um prophet or an antichrist type figure so this the, the lord is our guide here it has to be spirit and truth it has to be the accumulation of both and i've started off here it's quite heavy but there's hope okay there is hope we're going to read the final chapter now and then end on the blessings um, of, of, of this uh, Parsha. So we'll read the last 20 verses and then we'll come to a close shortly. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the case which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your fathers, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us? and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea, that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us, and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the God, Lord, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and save them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give them. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. so that's, that comes to the end of our Parsha reading there. We're just going to break it down a little bit. Um, and we see here a, a beautiful prophetic word of God is gathering his people. Um, and we only have to look around uh, the room to see God is returning his people to ancient ways. He truly is. 
and it's to get rid of this bitter religiosity and um, that has infiltrated the faith and, and and to return back to the the true vine and i've got some prophetic words here and um, what i'd like to share but let's just highlight a few first and um, we see and you return to the lord your god and obey his voice according to all that i command you today you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul that the lord your god will bring you back from captivity Later on we read, Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. I see this in two parts here. I see us in this transition stage now. We've been um, freed from captivity. We truly have. We've been born again. We've been bought at a price. Um, yes, we are living in Babylon, um, but, but we've been free. We, we, we're on a different um, path now. We're no longer serving sin. We're no longer in a bondage to sin. We're serving life. Are we quite there in the land? Uh, that the father possessed no we're not quite there yet i believe that's not going to happen till um the coming reign of messiah and um, where, where he's going to blow the shofar and a yin gathering is going to take place beautiful scripture here in isaiah 11 let's read it on that day the root of jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples the nations will see him and his place of rest will be glorious on that day the Lord will extend his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, uh, from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner to the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will collect the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Powerful. This is what we're going to see now in the end times. And, and, and I've, I've even got a suspicion Joe might even include that one on his t trumpets teaching because it's so powerful. It's the gathering of the exiles. Reading on now, we also see in Isaiah, In that day the Lord will thresh from the flowing of the Euphrates to the Wadi of Egypt, and you, O Israelites, will be gathered one by one. And in that day, a great ram's horn will sound and those who are perishing in Assyria will come forth with those who are exiled in Egypt and they will worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. And in gathering, that's what we're seeing taking place. And this is the beginning of the in gathering. So we need to take faith in this. We need to see that when it's addressing us, the word, that we're a part of this journey now of, of leaving Egypt. It goes on in Ezekiel. We read, for this is what the Lord God says, behold, I, will, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out, wow, God himself, as a shepherd looks for his scattered sheep when he is among the flock. So I will look for my flock, I will rescue them from all the places to which they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements of the lands. Uh, of the land, I will feed them in good pasture, and the lofty mountains of Israel will be their grazing land, where they will lie down in a good grazing land. They will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. So where's Yeshua in our pasture? Where is he this week? He's all over the place. Without the good shepherd, we cannot be gathered. We read in the gospel accounts, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And this is what we see taking place here. We all wouldn't be in this room if we just believed the Torah alone. I don't believe that for one minute. We believe, I believe we're in this room because we have the combination of returning back to his ways, but we have the, 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 the foundation of Christ Yeshua. That's why we're all in this room here today. <clears throat> Without the good shepherd, we cannot be gathered. And... That was the missing link, you see, when he was dispersed into Assyria, when, he, when, when Israel uh, was dispersed, they needed the good shepherd to come and, and restore his people and to gather his people. And we see this in Matthew, don't we? Um, there's there's, there's a, a Syrian woman who, who approaches um, our master, or sorry, a Canaanite woman who approaches our master Yeshua. Let's read it in the gospel accounts of what he says. Leaving that place, Yeshua withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is miser miserably possessed by a demon. But Yeshua did not answer a word. 
So his disciples came and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. But Jesus replied, It is not right uh, to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. O oh, woman, Yeshua answered, Your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you desire. And your daughter was healed from that very hour. We see an incredible faith here from the Canaanite woman that she understood that through her faith, through her plea to her master, that a healing could take place. And I see that exact same picture of what we're reading now in the Torah portion of where we see the stranger there. And, 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 and what do we see with Abraham? Abraham was counted righteousness by his faith. It's our faith that allows us to enter in to this common promised land. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Romans chapter 2 verse 28. A man is not a Jew because he is one outwardly, nor is circumcision only outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew because he is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by written code, such as man's praise, does not come from men, but from God. We see here in Romans a, 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 an understanding, I believe, of what's being presented in Deuteronomy. We're seeing that it's an inward circumcision that counts us as a Jew. It's an inward circumcision that counts us as a citizen to Israel. A citizen to be able to inherit um, the common promised land. This allows us to become part of the commonwealth of Israel. We later on read, For this commandment I give you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. We may hear in modern Christianity today that the Lord is too difficult, but Deuteronomy proves otherwise. Mm -hmm. We may also hear it's impossible to keep all the laws. That's correct. You're sure they can keep all the laws. Some laws are only meant for women. Some laws are only meant for farmers. Um, but we can try our utmost to do the ones we can. And if we can't in the physical, we can at least try spiritually. And Yeshua elevated the commandments to another level. He said, even by looking at a woman, you can commit adultery. So we know here that this goes beyond the written text. There's a spiritual application that's taking place here. So our partial ends with Moses sharing with, sharing with us. And he says, this day... Not yesterday, not 2,000 years ago, but this day, choose life. I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life so that you and your descendants may live and that you may love the Lord your God, obey him and hold fast to him. For he is your life and he will prolong your life in the land that the Lord swore to give you to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's true what he's saying. He's going to give us life in, in, in the next life. He's going to give us eternal life if we hold fast. So in this faith, let us walk by holding on to the law, not because we are saved through it, but because it is our inheritance. It is we are being grafted in. These are the rules of the citizenship of our, um, of our, of our new of our new kingdom and just like those who was about to inherit the promised land it wasn't because they kept the law that they was allowed in it was because of abraham and the faith he had as we see here it was because of abraham isaac and jacob it is the faith we have that gets us in not by the law but the law is the guide to know when we are going off track Moses' apprentice, Joshua, continues this message. But if it is unpleasing in the sight to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Ecclesiastes. 
when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. We come back where we started now of the Torah portion title, Nitzavim. And the word Nitzav in the Hebrew, as Tommy mentioned, it can mean to stand, one standing, to be upright, to be stationed, to be appointed. In this sense, it's almost like a military conscription. They're all standing there before God, swearing into the vow. So this day we've got to ask ourselves, who, which God will we serve? Whom will we serve? I'd like to end on the scripture, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Nevertheless, conduct yourselves in a, worthy, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you will stand firm in one spirit, contending side by side for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is the clear sign of their destruction, but of your salvation and it is from God praise be to Yah so let us reevaluate where we stand this day not next week not the month later not oh I'll sort this out first this day let us reevaluate where we stand let us choose who we will serve in thought and action and if we choose to serve our father let us stand firm in one spirit side by side by another in the faith of the gospel message and with that, brothers and sisters, we'll come to the end of the portion at uh, Nitzavim. Shabbat Hallelujah. shalom. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah.